All right. Well, welcome. Um, hope you're having a good day so far at NDC. Uh, I hope you are also here to learn about Git, because if you're not, then go away. Um, so I'm Keith, and I like Git, and, and we're going to talk about it today. So uh, just a little bit about me. I'm from Iowa, which I was corrected. Uh, it's not the middle of nowhere, because I don't, in fact, consider the US to be nowhere. Uh, it's just the middle of nowhere within the country. Um, I work at JNP Cycles selling motorcycle parts, which is more interesting than it sounds. Uh, I work on an open source project called Posh Git. Uh, I blog with Los Techies. I'm a C-sharp MVP, which of course does not apply today at all. Uh, so yeah, so that's me. Uh, so who are you? So uh, people that are using centralized version control primarily. TFS, subversion, that sort of thing. All right. Of those, who is not f at least familiar with you know distributed concepts and you know has anyone never used Git before? Okay, so so this talk is not well. All right, so this talk is not an intro to Git. This is not getting started or you know how to install it or anything like that. Um, so I'll try to. I don't know. I, I'm going to make a few assumptions. I'm hoping you can catch up and at least get some value out of it. If you can't, then. Uh, go to Phil's talk a couple hours ago. Um, so we're not going to talk about intro level stuff. We're not going to talk about pushing and pulling or team workflow in general. That's all very interesting stuff, but there's just too much other stuff to talk about. Uh, not going to talk about internals, blobs, and trees. We're not going to talk about stuff that I don't use. What we are going to talk about, uh, going to talk through some config stuff that you should know about. Uh, going to talk through uh, some ways that you can name commits because those apply for lots of lots of things. I'm going to talk about local workflow options, fixing oops, if you get lost, make a mistake, that kind of thing. And finally, if we have time, we'll talk about Git bisect for finding bugs. So um, this is a 75-minute talk in an hour, but if you do have questions, sh please you know, interrupt me and we'll make do. I would rather answer your questions than get through a slide deck. So, All right, so first up, config. So. Uh, Git help config lists out hundreds, literally hundreds of options for configuring Git to work like you want it to. Um, you can see your current configuration with a git config l, and configuration is set up essentially in three levels. Uh, there's a repository level config that lives in .git slash config. Uh, there's a user level that lives in your user directory, .git config, and there's a system level one that's installed with your distribution of Git. Uh, when you're making changes, you'll almost always want to make those at the global level. Don't do it in system because that might get overwritten by a future install. Don't do it in repo if you want to share it elsewhere. So if you have repository specific stuff, certainly local, is, you know, the default is fine. But for aliases and that sort of thing, you're going to want to use the user level config. All right. So I wish I'd known about this. Git config e will open your config file in your editor. I used to just go into user and you know, so git config dash e is going to open that up. When you open it up, this is what you're going to see. There are two kinds of configurations, just section level ones that just live, it looks kind of like an INI file. You've got core is the top level namespace and then auto CRLF. If it's a three, uh, three value pair, then that's going to live in branch and then the subsection master and then you've got rebase and remote and merge and that sort of stuff. So this is what a config file looks like and uh, yeah. So just to call out a few interesting settings that you're probably going to, uh, you know, might be interested in. Uh, Core.editor, if you don't like VI, which is what ships with uh, MSIS Git by default. I'm not sure, does GitHub for Windows change that to Notepad or something? Yep. Okay. Okay, so GitHub for Windows recently released, I hope you know about it, uh, will change that for you to whatever your text editor is. Uh, but if you don't use GitHub for Windows or whatever, core.editor is where you can change that. Diff.renames is interesting. Uh, by default, log and diff and that sort of stuff don't detect if there are renames and copies. Those are not explicitly tracked by Git. It just figures it out based on content. So if you want Git to do that detection for you, you can set diff.renames to either rename or either true or copies. Uh, I usually use copies. Uh, diff tool merge tool prompt by default, which is silly. I just asked you to use the diff tool or merge tool. So go ahead and turn that off. Uh, Formatting is weird, but uh, merge tool keep backup. Uh, the dot .orig files that show up with a merge tool, you can make those go away. I've never found any value in those. Uh, Help.autocorrect, if you are not very good at typing, uh, git status will turn into git status automatically if you set help.autocorrect to a negative value. 
uh, or positive value, that's the number of deciseconds it will wait. It actually uses the word deciseconds in the documentation. So high five to whoever did that. And then finally, log.date will change your default uh, date display format for diffs and logs and that sort of thing. So if you prefer relative, two minutes ago, 10 days ago, that sort of thing, uh, you can change the log.date setting uh, as well. So uh, just a few interesting config options. The most interesting config stuff happens with your aliases. Aliases always live in git config. Um, and uh, the simple case is just to wrap a command and its arguments. So if I make an alias called ds, just to have a shortcut for a diff stat, stat's the one with that shows all the files and a summary of how much has changed. If I alias that as ds, then when I do a git ds, then that translates into git diff stat. If I add git ds dev, that's going to show me a diff with stat for the dev branch. So basically anything you pass after the alias is just tacked on to the end of the command that you pass in. You know, so that's the simple case. Highly recommend that you alias as much as makes sense for your workflow. You can also use git aliases to wrap shell commands. So anything prefixed with a bang is going to just get executed as a shell command. So if you like git k with the all parameter, which is going to show you all your branches, all your remotes, that sort of stuff, you can just make a git ka alias and you know, save a couple of characters. More interestingly, though, you can use that to chain git commands together as well. So if you want to commit all, or call, I guess, uh, you can say git add dash a and git commit. You know, that's just, you know, in bash, and is going to tack commands together. And so git call now is going to add everything to your index and then commit it for you. Uh, we're not pressing any options to commit, so it's just going to open up the, the window and, and ask you for the message. So uh, just some other interesting aliases. Uh, I have a di alias that's an alias for diff dash dash stage. That's going to show you what's in your index. Uh, I, I like an alias new because my master is always clean. So everything since master, master dot dot, everything since master is going to show me all of the commits that I've made recently uh, since master. Uh, RBC, I, I rebase all the time. So RBC is worth having. Uh, if you use git SVN, I have a couple aliases that vastly simplify the process of managing SVN as your remote. Uh, so I would recommend you go check that post out. And then finally, uh, git LG is a, an alias that uh, is documented at that, the post link there. It'll actually show you essentially a git case style display within your shell. So you can see you know, merge commits and what branches you have and, and where those all interrelate. If you do like a git LG and then dash dash all, that'll show you the same thing as git k, all your branches and how they interact and where they are relative to master and everything. Uh, so uh, check that out as well. Any questions about aliases or config in general? Pretty simple stuff. I just want to make sure you know about it because it's useful. All right, so uh, naming commits. Um, when you're working in git, a lot of commands, you know, rebases and cherry picks and all that sort of stuff, they all take a reference to a commit. And so getting good at naming commits without typing out that 40 character SHA is going to save you a lot of time. So I just wanted to walk through a couple of the different ways that can, you can name a commit. So a commit's primary identifier is the 40 character SHA-1 hash of the contents of the file when it was committed, who made the change, that sort of thing. Uh, you can use the full SHA, but you can also use a unique substring. So if you use the first six characters, as long as Git doesn't have two of those, then it'll, you know, that's good enough. You could use two characters if you're lucky. Um, so you can always use a substring of the SHA-1 hash. Uh, there are also references, symbolic references, both branches and tags. Uh, branches live under refs heads, dev, uh, refs heads, tags live under ref, uh, ref tags. The difference, of course, is that on a branch, when you commit, the branch moves forward. If you've checked out a tag for some reason and you commit, that tag stays where it was. You certainly don't want version 1 to move forward with you over time. Uh, there are also remote references. Those live under refs, remotes, and then the remote name, and then the branch name. Uh, and you can alias those without the refs remotes as well. You know, so these are all pretty standard. You'll see these in a lot of documentation. Um, a few others that you, you might have heard of. Well, OK, so head you've definitely heard of. So head is always what's checked out. Head is always one of two things. Either it's a reference to a branch. And so in the head file, dot git slash head, that'll just be a ref to you know, refs head's master. Um, and when, when you commit then, if head is a reference, then that reference moves forward with that commit. On the other hand, you can also check out an arbitrary commit, and that puts you in the, a state that's called a detached head. Detached meaning that when you commit, nothing refers to that new commit. 
You know, there's no branch that's moving forward. It's still there. You can still reference it, but it's detached. And so when you commit, there's no branch to update. So that's head. A few other interesting ones. A ridge head is something Git saves for you when you do something dangerous. So after, a, well, before a reset or a rebase, uh, that kind of thing, it's going to tag a ridge head with where you were before that went, you know, before that happened. Something went wrong, you can just reset yourself back to a ridge head and pretend that you didn't mess up. Um, fetch head is always saved when you do a fetch. Uh, so if you wanted to maybe fetch from somebody's specific branch without actually adding a remote for them and stuff, that'll just pull it pull their branch down into your local repository, fetch head will reference that branch. So you can just say, hey, merge that particular thing instead of setting up a remote and that kind of thing. Uh, merge head is the incoming merge commits. If you see it, that's what it is. It's not particularly useful for end users. So those are all the friendly names for commits, head, ridge head, that sort of thing, refs, branches. Um, stuff gets interesting when you start adding suffixes. So there are a couple suffixes that I wanted to point out. So tilde is going to let you get to parents. So that's going down, um, you know, if you have merge commits, then it'll always follow the first parent. And so tilde is just my parent, so head tilde is the commit before my current one. Or, you know, head tilde 5 is five commits ago. Uh, caret is, going to, be the is be going to be the nth branch, or nth parent, rather. So if you do have a merge, I mean, you can merge five branches, you know, five branches into one if you want. So caret one, two, three, four, and five would be the five commits that contributed to that one merge commit. So uh, just to kind of you know, put that in perspective, three commits ago is either going to be head tilde three or head caret, 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 first parent, first parent, first parent. The first parent of my first parent's parent is three commits ago. I very rarely use caret. I almost always use tilde, but I also don't merge very often. Okay, uh, the other interesting one that you'll probably see if you've ever looked at the ref log is an at with squigglies and then a number. So that's going to be the nth prior value for that reference. So if I merge into master, master at braces one is going to be where master was before what it is now. The most interesting, well, most common use case for that is going to be head. So if I mess something up, head at one is going to be where I just was. Uh, so like to, do, to undo the last commit, just reset to that head at one, and that'll take you to before the current commit. Uh, there are a lot more ways to do that. You can do things re using relative dates, you know, where master was five weeks ago. Uh, GitHub revisions has all the documentation there. It also describes the difference between master dot dot and master dot dot dot. So uh, there's that. Uh, also, I didn't say at the beginning, but all these slides are on GitHub at dollbyk slash presentations. So if you don't want to take notes, these slides will be up there. So let's talk about local workflow. Local workflow is, I think, the biggest... Okay, so distributed version control in general has lots and lots and lots of advantages to be able to do really interesting things. Local workflow is where Git in particular stands out to me. Um, it has lots of options that, you know, because of its view on, you know, history and changes and that sort of stuff, it, you know, that's where it really stands out above, you know, Mercurial or, or that sort of thing for me. So, uh, rule number one of, of local workflow, branch religiously. It's ridiculously cheap, so do it as much as you want. Branching is as simple as writing 40 characters to a file. That's all a branch is. You know, there's no expense to it, so if you want to save... You know, I'm going to do something that might be really stupid, so I'm going to save where I am just in case I want to be able to get back there easily. That's all a branch is. It's just a reference to that commit. So all right, so my branch dash back. This is a backup just in case I screw something up. When you're done with it, just delete it. It's no, no harm, no foul. So yeah, branch religiously. Uh, and it, since you're going to be branching all the time, branch dash dash merged is going to show you all the branches that have been merged into master. When you're done with a feature branch, it's going to turn up something like this. So this is an easy way to clean those out. I actually have a PowerShell function that iterates over that and it deletes anything that's not master and not the current branch, which is pretty handy. All right, so my workflow in a nutshell. Rule number one, keep master clean. Do not work in master unless you're going to push it straight away. Keep master just to represent, I mean, I always keep my master in sync with my upstream. So, you know, wh whoever's origin master, upstream master, whatever you call it, I always try and keep my master in sync with that. So that when I'm working locally, I want to know, hey, what's changed in my current branch relative to upstream? All right, that's that, that get new, get master dot dot, everything since master. 
So that's rule number one, always keep master clean. Rule number two, always create topic branches from master. So when you're about to work on something new, you know, I, I don't know how many times I've seen people just say, all right, it's time to switch context and work on something else. All right, get checkout dash B. All right, well, you are in the middle of something, and now your new thing is also in the middle of something. So you'll always want to create your branches off of master. Interestingly, you can create an alias. Check out master dash B. Give it a branch name. Ha ha, new branch for master. This is why aliases are cool. Finally, commit more than feels natural especially as you're just getting to know Git and distributed source control in general, commit more than feels right because there's extreme value to having lots of small commits as we're going to see later on. If you have lots of big commits and now you want to start doing interesting things, first you've got to split them up before you can do interesting things. So commit more often. You have a, ta a passing test, commit. It may turn out that that gets rolled in with a couple other passing tests, but you at least have a working bit of code. So go ahead and commit that, save it. If you want to just start tacking stuff on later, that's totally fine. So, all right, so any questions so far? Okay, uh, so Stash is, Stash is interesting. Um, I mean, Git in general, I feel it, it, it's built by developers because they know how developers work. I know that often someone will come in and say, hey, I need you to stop what you're doing and go look at this. Who has not had that happen? Not a single person. So, you know, so, you know, distractions happen. So if you're in the middle of something, what do you do? Well, you have a couple options with Git. One option is stash. Stash essentially says, take all the changes that I have in progress, tuck them away for a rainy day, and then leave me with a clean state so I can switch to another branch or whatever. So your workflow is going to look something like this. I'm on my topic branch. Boss comes in and says, hey, the world is on fire. I do a git stash save. Give yourself a message to remind yourself what on earth you were doing. Otherwise, it's just whip which is not particularly useful. Go ahead and switch to another branch, hack away, save the day, cool. When you're done, switch back to your branch, and then you'll do a git stash pop to bring that stash back into your working directory. They use pop because stashes are stored in a stack, so the most, you know, uh, first in, last out. So the most recent stash is always going to be on top, so pop will take that off the stack, apply it to your local directory, your, to your working directory, and then delete the stash. Uh, if you don't want that stash to go away for some reason, you can also use get a, uh, stash apply. Some other interesting stash options. Uh, stash save with include untracked will grab untracked files. Otherwise, git doesn't know about them, so they don't come along for the ride. A uh, shortcut for that is git stash save dash u. Uh, git stash list shows all your stashes. Uh, stash show dash p will show a patch of a particular stash. Uh, drop a stash. Uh, stash branch will create a new branch for you at a stash, so essentially with the contents of a stash. That's an easy way to say, oh, hey, I've, you know, I, I have work in progress, and I realized that I was supposed to create a new branch. All right, go ahead and stash it, and then stash branch will tuck it in a way into a different, um, tuck it away into a different branch for you. So with great power comes great responsibility. This is the problem with stashes. This is on my personal machine, where I don't work very often, at least I tell my wife I don't. So I don't work very often on my local machines. I have 16 stashes. The oldest is from 2010. That's two years old. I have no idea what that code is. Stashes go stale extraordinarily easily. A stash that doesn't apply cleanly stays in the stash list because you know Git can't say, hey, you have those changes now. So if you apply a stash and there's a merge conflict, or well, even if you pop a stash and there's a merge conflict, the stash stays out there. So you have to remember to go and delete it. So this is the problem with stashes. It's hard to manage. You know, they don't, they're not namespaced. It's just, here's all the stashes on, on, my, on my repository. So a better option, potentially, is going to be a temporary commit. You want your work in progress to live with the branch where it's work in progress. So your workflow is much the same. Working on topic branch, boss comes in, please save the day. All right, I'd love to save the day. All right, grab all your changes, commit them. Just name it something useful. Whip, I need an implementation for these passing tests. Or vice versa, it's okay, we won't tell. So you switch to your other branch, you save the day, boss is happy. Now you're when you come back, you switch to your topic branch, and the changes you were working on are right there. You know, for me, it's a get new, show me everything since master. Oh, hey, my most recent commit's a work in progress. Then you just reset head tilde, head tilde being parent of me. Reset head tilde, undo that commit. Pretend it never happened. Now we're back where we were before the emergency. 
So now if I have 10 different branches, I could have potentially 10 different work in progress commits saving all those things. Trying to manage those within your stash is much more difficult. All right, so we just talked a little, I, I just mentioned git reset head tilde. Reset's kind of a cause for much concern and questions, so I thought I'd kind of explain the two options. So the first purpose of reset is for individual files, and that's to reset the index for that path to match a certain commit. Now this is most commonly used for unstaging. So here are three synonymous ways to unstage something. After you've added it, if you want to remove it from the index, not included in the next commit, you can do a git reset head. So make the index look like head, which was the last commit, which is unstaging. And then that particular file, you can leave out the dashes. The dashes are really just there for disambiguation. So if you happen to have a file in your repository named head, you would have to have the dashes. Um, so yeah, you, you can leave out head, you can leave out the dashes. Um, so that's how you would unstage. So that's get use one of reset, is just manipulating the index directly, essentially. The other option for reset is to reset head to reference a commit. So you're moving head. So I made my work in progress commit, now I want to move head back to here. Moving head says when I make a new commit, this is its parent. That's essentially what head is. So um, what does this look like? Well, uh, it might be used to discard the previous commit, like we just saw, git reset head tilde. Or it might be to say, make head look like my remote branch. And you see, that's a reset hard. All right, so, so what is hard? Hard is one of the modes. Oh, come on. Okay. Uh, so there are three modes that you care about. First is soft. Soft is going to move the head, but doesn't touch the index or the work tree. It's essentially an uncommit. So the content is still in the index. So if you were to commit again, it would create a new commit with the contents matching exactly. Um, so that's soft, it's an uncommit, not particularly useful, um, but you know, it is what it is. Mixed is the default, and that's going to reset the index, but not the work tree. This is essentially unstaging something. The, re the index now looks like head most of the time, but your work tree doesn't, isn't affected. So now you can add things again and commit as you want. And the final option is hard. That's going to reset the index, same as mixed, but also reset the working tree. So any changes you've made are discarded. This is one of very, very few dangerous options in Git. This is destructive. This will actually take changes you have and throw them away. So use this with caution. If you're not sure, you could stash the changes. I might want them someday. You could make a work in progress commit and then reset back. All right, I have that commit saved just in case. Heck, make a temporary branch. Work in progress. This kind of works, but I'd like to do it better. Save that branch away, delete it sometime, and then you can reset hard, throw away those changes, and try again. So yeah, hard, very dangerous. Unfortunately, most of people's interaction with reset is what status tells you to do to unstage something, get reset head, file name, or reset hard because that's how somebody told you to get rid of changes. Reset's a lot more powerful than that. All right, so we've talked a lot about the index and stages and that sort of stuff. Um, these should probably be somewhat familiar to you. They're commit dialogues from HG and TFS and, and Subversion. What do they have in common? Aside from a message and a list of files and everything. Checkboxes. The checkboxes say, commit this. If it's not checked, it doesn't get committed. That's the index. You know, so this is, this is the git extensions commit window. That's the index. Those are your checkboxes. Include these files. The index isn't anything special. It's just this notion of committing some of changes, but not all, baked into the version control system. Why is that useful? I mean, in Subversion, you have to list out all the files you want to commit if you don't want to commit everything. So why is this useful? That's why it's useful. I have the file both ready to be committed and not ready to be committed. That's kind of weird. So let's talk about that. So that's going to be an add-p. So add-p allows you to handle overlapping logical changes to one file. So suppose you've been reformatting and refactoring and also adding new functionality. 
I'm a stickler for this. I do not like new functionality baked in with reformatting. Because if something breaks, I want to be able to tell, is it the reformatting that broke it or is it the new functionality? I hope it's not the reformatting because if it is, you suck. <laughs> Sorry. You know, so especially later, hopefully, about bisect. Bisect allows you to pinpoint a specific commit where something broke. The bigger your commits, the less useful bisect is. So we don't want to have reformatting lumped in with refactoring because reformatting is benign. Refactoring could potentially break things. And new functionality, well, you know, who knows? So when you have that, git add dash patch is going to allow you to fix it. So add dash patch is going to ask you to pick hunks, just a fancy name for sections of a diff, that you want to stage. When you're doing this patchwise add, there are kind of a couple main operations, yes or no, do I want to include this or not? A or D, do I want to include the rest or do I not want to include the rest? Instead of hitting N a whole bunch of times. S, if the hunk is too big, so if there's you know, a change and then three lines later another change, Git's going to think those are pretty much the same because they show up within the same hunk window. It's essentially, it's a, an artifact of how they do diffs. So you can split those so it's one line at a time. And then finally, edit. If splitting still doesn't get you specific enough, you might actually have to edit the patches where you essentially say, this is what I'd like the commit to look like. All right? So in addition to adding, you can also do this for resets, for checkouts, and for stashing. So if you want to say, hey, I really like this method, but it doesn't apply here, get stash dash p. Go grab just that thing, stash it away. Everything else stays intact. Are we seeing how this might be useful? All right, well, let's look at it just to try and reinforce. All right, so I work on, just for giggles sometimes, an open source project called libgit to sharp. Um, just .NET bindings for a C library implementing Git. Uh, and so I've, d I've just got some changes that I made that I'd like to commit. So, you know, I deleted some stuff, I deleted some stuff, but I also did some cleanup in repository.cs because, well, here, this is kind of, you know, let me open up a... All right, so I've got four files changed here. Uh, repository extensions, I mean, so these three files, I want everything. But repository here, we've got, you know, removed an unused using statement. That, I mean, that doesn't really... I renamed a variable because I think the variable needs a better name, but that doesn't really apply to the bigger change that I'm making either. So what I'd like to be able to do is say, all right, let's grab the reformatting of removing the unused using, and um, I think there was some white space later that, I mean, I just did an auto format and, and Visual Studio found a couple of things. So let's try and split this file into three separate commits, one for the reformatting, one for the refactoring of renaming that variable, and then finally one with the actual feature change of moving the, the commit. So I'm going to do a git add dash p and then now grab uh, lib git to sharp repository as the file that I want to stage. So now this opens up and it gives me options. It says, all right, what things do you want to commit? Or what do you want to stage? So looking at this, all right, so system.link, I know that that was added for the change, you know, the actual proper change that I want. So I'm going to say split this to let me stage the globalization change but not stage system.link. So now it takes me to the next change. I know that this is related to the renaming. Well, we're still working on reformatting right now, so I'm going to say skip this one. Uh, let's skip this one too. It's the renaming. Um, this looks really big, so I'm going to split it just to make sure. All right, so that's one big patch up there. We don't want, we don't want that easier. All right, here's a little just bit of reformatting. Added a space. Visual Studio cares about spaces. All right, so now if I do a git di, that's my diff dash dash staged, I see we have the unused using stripped out, we have a bit of white space adjustment, and that's it. Okay, so now I can go ahead and commit this. Get commit, minor formatting. All right, now let's go ahead and take care of the refactoring. Get add dash p, don't want that, do want that, do want that, split that. We don't want that new functionality, but we do want that. So here, Disposables to clean up, disposables to clean up, disposables to clean up. E name variable. That's a field. And finally, we have the stuff that's actually related to the feature change. Now, what if I wanted to, all right, so before I commit this change, what if I wanted to say, well, let's hold on just a minute. 
let's make sure that things are actually happy with the other changes that I've already committed. All right, so I can go ahead and stash these away. I can flip over here into Visual Studio, run the build. Hey, build succeeded. All right, so we didn't break anything. That's good. That, had, that tends to happen sometimes. Like there was that commit that had a big chunk up here and then a small one. If we hadn't split that, we might have accidentally included some changes that we didn't mean to. So it's always good to sometimes check this stuff. All right, so we're good. Everything builds. Get stash pop to bring it back. And then now let's go ahead and commit this. Uh, move, what was it? Move com commit collection dot create. I'm actually doing real work, so thanks for, thanks for being patient. Uh, to repository dot commit. All right, cool. So now if I do a new, we see that we've got minor reformatting, we've got rename field, and we've got moving the commit collection create to, all right. So far, so good. I mean, so are we seeing why this is useful, being able to split this stuff up? All right. And like I said, I mean, it works for reset. So if with an add dash P, you stage something that you didn't, need, didn't mean to, you can just come in here and say, all right, get reset dash P. All right, let me reset some of the changes from the index to unstage them so that I can commit a clean copy. All right. Now, just for giggles, one more trick. All right, so I'm just going to undo the last commit so we have something to play with. Git add dash p. Um, all right, so I'm going to mark this one for edit. So edit actually opens up that big old patch and lets me come in here. So I can actually go in and make changes. So I could say... Um, Let's add a line that says, hello, uh, let's make it a comment so it's not to break something. Hello, NDC. Then we delete a whole bunch of stuff, and let's go ahead and quit because we don't. All right, so now I'm looking at my index. So we deleted some stuff, but we also had hello, NDC. Now if I do a git diff, we see that we're deleting hello, NDC. So this is a change that never existed on the file system, but now we're applying it into the git index. So essentially, we're committing something that never existed. So if I go ahead and commit this, stash these away just so we can you know, not have those changes, now I can come in here. Hello, NDC. So that change has already been committed. You know, we have a clean working copy right now. It's in the index, and it's committed. All right. So this is the stuff, this is why the index is cool. You can't do this in subversion. You can't do this in T. I, don't, I can't even say it. Um, <laughs> all right, any questions about the patchwise stuff? Editing is kind of weird, especially if you use an editor. Like, uh, so Phil and I were looking at something yesterday. He was trying to do, to do an edit with Notepad2, and I think because of some weird line ending stuff, Git was seeing the line feeds as changing to carriage returns, and so it was getting confused. Um, that's part of the reason that I use VI, A, because it's awesome, and B, because that sort of weird stuff doesn't really affect me. Um, so you might see some weird stuff with edits like that. Uh, yeah, so just FYI. Um, but yeah, it's, it's super useful. So any questions? All right. All right, so that's patchwise adding. So the other thing that I really like about Git is that it's very open about the need to rewrite history. I find it very interesting, Mercurial recently added this idea called phases, where you can essentially mark a commit as either being production ready or just a work in progress. They're admitting that Git was right, that some commits are final and some commits are not. You know, they kind of codify it as the separate thing of phases and now I have to move things from phase one to phase two or whatever they're called, I don't know. I just know that Git's model just says, all right, it's just a commit. If I want to undo it and make a new commit, that's fine. So yeah, so let's talk about rewriting history. Rule number one, it's permanent when it's pushed. After you've shared your changes with anybody, unless they're expecting that you might do some rewriting of history, don't do it. After you've pushed to master, you can't make changes to stuff that's been pushed to master. However, until something's been pushed, pretend you're perfect. Pretend you wrote those tests first or with the, with the functionality. Pretend that you didn't make a typo in the commit message. Forget that you didn't, you know, pretend that you didn't forget to include the csproj change for a new file. Who hasn't done that? Just for the record, let it show no hands went up. 
You know, so these are all problems that don't need to corrupt your history. History should be useful. With bisect, history has to be useful. If you get to the point where you can't build the project because you forgot to include a CS proj file, well, that's just not useful. Bisect now says, sorry, can't help. So go ahead and fix it. Fix it on your machine. Code review yourself. Make sure you're not doing anything dumb so that, I mean, pretend that you're contributing to an open source project. You wouldn't want to you know, send something up to Linus Torvalds saying, eh, here's a bunch of stuff, and I resharpened your project, and I... You know, you know, make nice, small, happy commits so you can say, here's feature A, here's feature B, and here's some refactoring that makes that all cleaner. Or refactoring up front. How, whatever it is, have that sort of pride in your work that you're doing too. You know, commit stuff well. Build up a good history. It's an asset if you make it. All right? So pretend you're perfect. So the simplest case, all right, I messed up the last commit. I forgot the CS proj. I fat fingered the commit message, whatever it is. Git commit amend just says take what's in the index now and stuck it in, you know, tuck it into the last commit. So that's the simple case. Uh, I do this so often that I have an alias for it. I have a CIA alias. CI short for commit, A amend. Kit commit amend dash C head. Dash C head says don't prompt me for a new message, just use the message from head. So this just says, take the index, put it in the previous commit, don't ask me anything else. Very handy. So let's say that I wanted to amend all of the current, you know, all of the changes right now, amend all of those pending changes, and reset author will say, all right, claim that and reset the timestamp to now. So you can pretend you fixed the stuff at 8.15 in the morning instead of 5 o'clock last night. So yeah, reset author, very handy for lying. All right, cherry pick. Uh, another way to rewrite history, it allows you to apply chain sets essentially anywhere. You want to grab a commit from over here, pull it over here. That's a cherry pick. So suppose you committed to the wrong branch. Darn it. I meant to switch context. I forgot to use Keith's wise checkout master dash B. All right, I committed to the wrong branch. Fine. We can fix it. So we're working, we're working, we're working. All right, darn it. Made my commit. Go ahead and switch yourself to the correct branch. Then you can do a cherry pick to the commit on the wrong branch. Suppose you didn't notice you were on the wrong branch until two commits in. All right, you can cherry pick wrong branch tilde and then wrong branch. So the commit before wrong branch and then wrong branch. Grab both of those, pull them both into my current branch. Then when you're done, switch back to wrong branch and use reset to go back before the erroneous commits. Ta-da, you're done. Yeah? Who hasn't made commits to the wrong branch before? Let the record show we have one liar. All right, all right, so that's cherry pick, also useful. Let's talk about merge and rebase. I wish this would work. All right, so merging without a rebase looks something like this. You know, so we, we branch out to topic, and we work on A, and we work on B, and we work on C. All right, well, somebody just cherry picked B into master because it was useful. It was a bug fix that you discovered while working on the feature. Then you brought it into master so it could be pushed before your topic branch was done. Once you start getting used to this idea of cherry picking, this happens all the time. So now we have two different versions of B. They're mostly the same, but one has a different parent, so Git sees them as different. So now if I'm looking at history, I don't know where the change, you know, I can't see easily where that change in B prime actually came from. Is it from B? Is it from B prime? They look pretty similar. That's why I don't like merging. If we were to rebase topic before we merged it into master, this is what we end up with instead. Git says, oh, hey, I recognize B. It's already in there as B prime, so I'm just not going to apply those changes. Or if you only pulled in part of the changes from B prime, but not all of them, it'll say, all right, well, now B is just the part of the changes that you didn't already have. You know, Git's pretty smart about that kind of thing. So rebasing allows you to have a nice, clean, linear history. Analogy, I, I don't remember where I picked it up, but thanks whoever it was. It's essentially like shuffling versus cutting. You know, so I'm making commits on topic branches. I'm making commits on master. So you can either shuffle them together and not really have any sort of you know, clear sense, or you can kind of cut the deck, stick your topic branch right on top of master, and now it's clear this is where master was. This is everything topic has. All right? So in summary, that is why I don't like merges. The top is a merge workflow. The bottom is a rebase workflow. It's really, really hard to tell where those commits came from, where the branch points are. You see that little gray line up there? Yeah, that's pointing to some point way up here. You have no idea where it is. This is very difficult history to follow. This is less useful history to follow. Yes? 
I'm sorry, can you try that again? You're losing information? What are you, what are you losing? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so so you you lose you lose the deliberate action of taking here are five commits and pull them into master. There's no one point where that happened, but you're still going to. I mean, it's not like you're going to just start you know pulling stuff into master haphazardly. It's going to be I'm done with feature A and that feature has eight commits, and you're going to merge them into master. It'll be a fast forward merge, and so you end up with a nice linear history. So now you've got eight commits related to feature A, and then now feature B over here that gets rebased on top of master, and now you've got the ten commits over there. So you've got Old master, eight commits, 10 commits. You haven't, uh, the only information you've lost is that that work was done in a branch. That's an implementation detail. That's not useful to history per se. So I mean, I'm not going to say that this applies in every case. And lots of people use merges and are very happy with it. But this is why I don't like merges. Merges don't play with bisects, um, all that sort of stuff. But I mean, if you would prefer, prefer to just have one commit, you know, like on GitHub, when I, when I say merge this pull request for me, it creates a commit that says, hey, I merged from this. Even if it's one commit, it still creates a merge commit for me. OK, it's useful that I know that this came from a pull request. But I want that to the, be the exception, probably, and not the rule, for my taste. You know, if, you, if you disagree, the nice part about Git, you can do whatever you want. Shoot yourself in the foot, just merge it right back on. <laughs> um, I can't take credit for that either. All right, so, so that's rebase. Rebase is essentially just a replay of commits. And so you know, we've got our A, B, and C. Rebasing those just says, all right, take A and try and apply it on master. Take B, try, oh, it, it already exists. All right, skip it. Then apply C. You know, so this is what you end up with. So let's talk about Rebase Interactive. This is where things get really fun. So Rebase Interactive allows you to replay commits with modifications. So instead of this, what if you wanted C to be up front? And then combine A and B together later. C was from use, some useful refactoring. A was the implementation. B was the test that you said you wrote with the implementation. So let's stick the refactoring up front because it would have been useful at the time, you know, information that would have been brought to my attention yesterday. Then we combine A and B together. Rebase Interactive allows you to do that. Finally, before we look at Rebase, the auto squash option. Uh, it's pretty handy. So suppose we're working on something, we commit, do something, we work, commit, work, commit, go on our merry way. Darn it, I forgot something. You know, I, I discovered that do something had a bug that I want to fix. I forgot the CS proj changes. Whatever. Go ahead and stage the changes that you want to be included with do something and then make a new commit and call it fix up, do something. So fix up and then also squash is an option. An interactive rebase will automatically put that in the right place in your little kind of history to-do list. You know, every time you do an interactive rebase, it just gives you a to-do list. That's do this commit, then this commit, then this commit. This auto squash takes that fix up commit and just sticks it right in the right place. All right? Okay, so you can turn that on all the time with rebase.auto squash equals true. I think that might be the new default. It didn't used to be. So yeah, make sure that auto squash is on because it's super handy. All right, so let's look at interactive rebase because it's awesome. All right, so these are my commits. You know, so I was just you know, kind of playing around. We were talking on the list yesterday. Hey, we should change all our, cre our create methods to add because it's collection semantics and all that sort of stuff. All right, so I started doing that work. But looking at it now, there are a couple things I'd like to change about how that work was done. I have an alias for rebase interactive because I do it so often. All right, so we're going to do a git rebase interactive dash or for master. So this now gives us a list of all those changes. And now we can say, all right, what do we want to do with them? There are a couple things that we can do. All right, so step number one, create add, or rename create to add in note collection and remote collection. So that seems to me like a commit doing too much. You know, we should separate the note collection change from the remote collection change, I think. So in, in rebase land here, we can say, hey, edit this. So that'll actually pause the editor and allow us to do whatever we want to that commit including splitting it in half. Uh, what else can we do here? Um, just for giggles, let's... All right, so 
Yeah, so I, I, I had a problem with uh, that rename create to add in repository extensions. What I'm realizing after the fact is that there are changes in there that are going to break for the branch collection and tag collection commits. So what I really want to do is I want to include this into the previous commit. Actually, I'll just have it, have it marked as a fix up. But I also want to edit this one so I can grab that, grab some part of that change and pull it back in. This is actually a scenario that Phil ran into earlier, earlier today. So we'll go ahead and mark that one for edit uh, as well. And then just for fun, uh, so F is just a shortcut for, for fix up. And then a few other interesting options. R is going to let you reword. So suppose I don't like that it's minor reformatting. I would rather calling it making it awesome. Uh, and then just for you know, kind of final, we're going to take that one and switch those two. So we're going to put rename field after test because we like the renaming of the field. Actually, instead of rewording this one, let's reword this one because that's a terrible message. Ah, what is going on? All right, so we're doing a couple things. We're going to edit the first one so we can split it in half. We're going to edit the branch collection one so we can grab a change from a future commit and pull it in now so that things don't break. We're going to uh, fix up the rest of the repository extension changes into the tag collection changes. And then finally, we're going to reword the test commit because we, there's a typo in the commit message or something. Oh, and we also reordered. So we've, we've done lots of things to this history to try and make it better, to try and make it more understandable for people. So we save our changes there. And now Git just goes through one by one. Our first commit was marked edit, so now we get to edit. So how would we go about splitting a commit? Well, we know that reset will allow us to essentially uncommit something. So let's do that. All right, so reset head. So now we have, uh, so this is posh git, by the way, that I'm using. So this, you know, the red uh, tilde four, that means that I have four files modified now. So we see we've got a note fixture change, a remote fixture change, note collection. All right, so let's add note collection and note fixture. So now if I look at my index, here's all the note collection stuff. That's probably easier to see. All right, so there's all the note collection stuff, and then there's all the remote collection stuff. So now my index has the note collection. All right, so we've split the commit successfully. Go ahead and commit. Uh, goodness, what was it called? Okay, whatever. Git commit, uh, rename, add, create to add in note collection. All right. Uh, add all these changes, rename, create to add in remote collection. What was that? All right, so now if we do a get new, that's going to show us all our commits since master. We see the two, cha the two commits that we just made. So far, so good. Rebase continue, or RBC because I do this so often. Rebase continue. Continue on your merry way. So now it's applying change here, or change here, change here. Now if I do a git new, we'll see that we've made some progress. So we had note collection, remote collection, reference, branch collection. So now here in branch collection, what I said is that there's a change here. All right, if I, you know, we'll show you. So here, I come over here, I, I build. Oh, hey, tag collection does not create a definition for create. So that's problematic. Oh, so this is the big problem, is that uh, branches.create doesn't exist anymore. So we could just come in here, fix it, and then go. But I'd rather be fancy. So I'm going to say, all right, so I'm going to use, all right, so repo, you know, so this is a log of repo commit. That's the old version of repo commit. While the rebase is in progress, the old reference is kept intact. This is just, you know, we're basically building up a new one, and then the last step is point the old at the new. Okay, so this is the old version. What I want to say is, let's grab this SHA, or I could just say repo commit tilde three, because that's three commits before repo commit. So we're going to say git checkout dash p that particular commit. So grab piece by piece the changes from that commit and give me the option to pull them into my current working directory. So we see here, this is tags, this is tags, so we don't want those. This is tags. This is tags, this is tags, 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 tags. Okay, D, don't 
ask me about the rest of the file. Haha, -ha, repository extensions. I could have actually just given the repository extensions path instead of seeing all of these, but anyway. So we don't want tags, we don't want tags, but we do want branches. Yes. And then go ahead and quit because I know everything else is fine. So now we come back here, we build, ta-da. Imagine this was a more sophisticated change than just renaming create to add, and you can see how this might be useful. We just cherry-picked from the future. This commit happened before, happened after the current commit in the old version of history. But to get, they're just commits. So we say, hey, grab, grab stuff from over there and pull it in. All right, so this is good. Uh, we're going to use my CIA alias to fold it in. Um, so now if we look at new, get show with branch collection, we'll see that there's, here's the repository extensions, rebase, continue. All right, this is the one we marked for reword. So uh, go ahead and rename it to something in commit collection. I don't even remember what. And then we're done. All right. So there's our new history. So we've got minor reformatting. We've got something in commit collection that used to be test and that used to be last. So now it's a commit before. Pretend that was refactoring that we wanted to use in an interesting commit. We split the first collection in half. We fixed the problem where branch collection wouldn't build. The, other, the rest of those changes from repository extensions, we fixed those up into the tag collection because really those should have been part of the other. You know, so this sort of, I mean, it, it can be a little bit tedious building up this nice clean history, but now when I submit this pull request, people can see exactly what I'm doing. Note collection, remote collection, ref collection, branch collection, tag collection, everything builds at every step in the way. If they just want the branch collection change, they can cherry pick it in. I'm just being a good citizen and get affords that flexibility. Yeah? Any questions about that? I mean, you, you, to really grok it, you have to use it. But, I mean, just make a feature branch, work for a while, and then just rebase dash i master. And see what happens. Play around. You'll get merge conflicts. Hey, this change right here depends on a change later, but I want to try and move that one earlier just to see what happens. You know, refactorings that you use in a, that you'd like to use in an earlier commit, mark that commit for edit, go use the refactored version instead of the version that you already had committed. The options are endless. But there's extraordinary power here. Extraordinary power. All right, let's proceed, because I'm actually not doing too bad on time. I have eight minutes? OK. Uh, all right, so fixing oops. So with rebases, you're going to screw up. You're going to delete a commit line on accident. You, know, you delete a commit line in that interactive rebase, I suppose I should have mentioned that. It goes away. It's just not there anymore. Git still knows about it, but in the history, in the new version of history, that commit doesn't exist anymore. Because as it was replaying, it just said, oh, I, I never saw that one, so I didn't think to pull it in. So if that happens, we need to be able to get it back. So how can we do that? That's where the ref log comes in. So git per machine keeps track of everywhere that your refs have been. You know, so that head at, z at one that I'd mentioned, that's using the ref log. So this is going to allow you to say, um, and you, can, you can take a look at those on the file system. You know, so this is all the, you know, the output from all of my ref log. So we'll see that uh, heads dev2. So my dev2 branch was created from origin dev2. Uh, master, I did a push. Uh, origin dev1 was updated by a push. And, you know, so I know now where all my remote branches have been, all my local branches have been. Uh, head isn't included here, but you get all of the heads. So. So those are all the places that head has been recently. You'll notice all the steps in the interactive rebase. We picked this one. We did a fix up. We did a fix up. We did a commit amend. That's where we created that branch collection or fixed the branch collection was that commit amend. Uh, reset moving to head tilde. All that sort of stuff is still out there. So if we deleted one of these commits on accident, we can just go back in history. All right, so git commit, git commit. All right, commit fix repository extensions. Before that, commit rename create. All right, so if this was the one that was gone, boom, grab that, cherry pick it back in, done. You know, so there's there's safety behind all of this. You know, if you happen to mess something up, the ref log can largely save you 
if you've committed. If you haven't committed something, it's gone, sorry. That's part of the reason that I say commit more often than you think you should. Because if you, eh, you didn't think that implementation was very good, so you scrap it and start over. Turns out that's the best option there is. Would you rather have deleted it, or you could stash it and say, oh, I might want this, or just make a temporary commit. Make a temporary commit and then tag it with a branch. Bad option. Let me try again. That's a perfectly valid branch name, by the way. Heck, just make a namespace. You can you know, do uh, you know, bad slash branches. And everything that lives in that namespace is something that you hope you don't have to use, but you will if you have to. All right? So the ref log. If you, if you have an oops with your rebases, with your whatever, you delete a branch you didn't mean to. Ref log can save you. Finally, let's talk about finding bugs. So I've talked a lot about you know, focusing on you know, small commits and atomic commits and all that. Bisect is one of the biggest reasons. Bisect does a binary search through your commit space, through your commit log. So suppose we've got these nine commits, and we know that at some point it was good, but currently it's bad. Somebody introduced a bug. Where did that bug happen? How would you solve that problem right now? Go inspect the logs, potentially. You know, check out some point in the past and try it. Bisect is a strategic way to say, all right, pick the point in the middle and let me tell you if it's good or bad. All right, that one's bad. So now we know that the problem is somewhere between good and bad. All right, so now pick the middle. That one's good. Pick the middle again. That one's also good. So now we've found the latest bad. Now I can go to that specific commit and fix the problem. You know, it's, it looks kind of silly over nine commits. But if we wanted to do 20 commits, it would be the same number of steps. It's a logarithmic sort of thing, an exponential decay. You know, a thousand commits. We have to test 10. 10,000 commits. We have to test more than 10. <laughs> so, so this is handy. And so uh, Bisect essentially just pauses you at each point and says, are we good? Neat way to handle that, stash the test that you want to fail and then just apply it each time it's paused. Discard the change, resect, or bisect, continue. Apply the stash again. All right, that adds the test back in. Oh, hey, run the test. The test failed. This one's bad. Or you can let, all right, so this is what it looks like. We start, we do bad, bad, good, bad, bad. Then when we're done, we do a reset. Run my script. You can give it a script that says, inject this test run my build. Based on the output code, determine if it's good or bad. Write this script in five minutes, go to lunch, come back, have your answer. Of course, this assumes that your build works every, every point in the way. If you get to a point where you forgot that CS proj, that's a useless commit. Sorry. That's why history matters. That's why this stuff is valuable. So we've talked about config, we've talked about aliases, we've talked about commit naming shortcuts, stashes, and work in progress commits. We've talked about a whole bunch of stuff. I hope you use some of it. You don't have to use all of it. I use most of it. You don't have to use all of it, but any one of these tricks, you know, just using rebases to you know, keep your history a little bit cleaner. Just using an interactive rebase to say, you know, this, this change really belonged first. Anything you can do to make your history better makes your code better. Any questions? Here are just some resources in the presentation. Questions? Yes? Yeah, so, so the point was that in, in some code bases, you know, as you're applying a rebase, if there's a merge conflict that keeps getting hit, then you're going to have to resolve that each time that it goes on through. And so, I mean, Git has a re-re-re feature that I've never used, but it helps to track conflict resolution. Uh, so, I mean, if, if merges work better in your code base, by all means. You know, th th this is a tool for you to leverage in the best way that suits you. Workflows, team, all that sort of stuff, 
You know, do, 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 what, do what feels right. But yeah, it's, I mean, it's, you know, I've never needed to do many merges, but I mean, right now I'm working on a .NET 4 migration, which includes updating assemblies and updating references and converting the projects and stuff. I might do a single merge commit and have it broken down. All right, update the references. You know, you know grab new d uh, assemblies, uh, update the CS proj, um, you know, whatever the rest of those changes are. So I, I have those five. Nowhere in there does the project work until we get to the very end. So rather than squashing that, I might want to save that, hey, there were these five commits involved. You know, so that might be somewhere that I use a merge because looking at history, that's the commit where things go wrong, where we pull all of those changes back in. So, I mean, it's not black or white, but yeah, that is a good point. Any other questions? Cool. Well, thanks for coming out and enjoy the rest of NDC.